Greetings and salutations, all you hardcore MMA fans out there. I'm your host, Dan the Wolfman, and welcome to another episode of MMA Technical Breakdown, aka The Recap. And unlike your run of the mill Monday morning analyst, I am actually an MMA technical expert with four coveted black belts. And for 20 years, I went around the world sparring all the top fighters in MMA. All over, all the fight teams, I did it. I've sparred them all, like 600, 700 top fighters. Guys, I think today I'll be breaking down two videos. I hope you guys have been appreciating it. Uh, seems some people are with a thumbs up uh, on my weight cutting. Really simple, doable way they could get rid of extreme weight cutting. That was the first video I made. And each week now, I'm trying to do a recap to see if this will catch on on all the MMA events that happened. There was a lot going on this week. Okay, International Fight Week with the UFC. There was also a really good PFL show. I think what I'll do for you guys, I hope you check out both. I'll make two different videos this time. I'll talk about the uh, 226 Stipe versus DC. I'll do that first. But guys, you're also going to want to check out my video where I talk about the PFL card, especially the huge upset in the main event that you're probably unaware of. PFL's actually been doing a really good job. Production-wise, it's on spot the way their point system is. The finishing percentages are way up. Um, like it's pretty, like you guys want to hear about what's going on in case you haven't tuned in yet. And you definitely want to hear about the uh, Ultimate Fighter finale, specifically the amazing performance there was in the main event that people are going to probably overlook because of the DC Steep A card. But an amazing performance. Who it will be the next super superstar that UFC really needs to sink, sink its teeth into that can help carry the company in the future. Um, you know, especially with all these uh, old timers like myself retiring. That they're, everyone's going away or going somewhere else. So guys, it, you're going to want to watch both videos. So let's get into the 226 card. Um, guys, it started out at welterweight between Max Griffin and Curtis Melender. They're very, very tall for the weight class. Melender, very good knees and calf kicks. But Griffin got a uh, double leg and a top half guard, landing ground and pound. Round two, Melander more knees and more calf kicks. Uh, but Griffin was busier overall, in my opinion. Griffin actually fought a really good fight, but the height and reach difference uh, was huge to make up. But Melander got a takedown at the end of the round, stealing him the round. Um, round three, Griffin fought very good, but Melander's output is, is way too little, really, in my opinion. And that's definitely perhaps because... I'm sure he does a huge weight cut to get that size advantage. It's actually something I don't really like seeing guys do or them making a career out of just being the, the, the better framed guy. But, um, but Melender did land a nice punch blitz, knees, and then an elbow, winning that fight 29-28 for Curtis Melender. Uh, commentators were going crazy over him. It was okay. I mean, it was decent. He had some decent timing on those counter knees to the body and stuff. Uh, but his output was pretty pretty crappy, uh, actually. You know, um, a little butt bit biased in the commentary. I mean, he did good. The other guy, I, I, Griffin, actually fought probably a technically better fight. Uh, you know, but when when you're going up against a guy who's a giant, things are difficult. You know, he's, he lost a close fight. Next up, Lando Veneta versus Drakkar Close. Drakkar comes out uh, and, and it gives the cage as a throw grab. Gee, I wonder who would talk about nasty combative techniques in MMA. I had a whole seminar back in like 2013 on it uh, about combative uh, throat grab and head twist. You'll hear more, more about that later. And then he did a spinning elbow against the cage. A lot of forward pressure. More calf kicks, which who's been preaching since 2012 in all the videos. The first video showing really calf kicks on YouTube and how to defend calf kicks, which everybody still doesn't know, guys. Multiple videos on that. Look at that on my page going back to 2012. Got a video doing a calf kick at Black House a week before Benson did it to uh, uh, Nate Diaz. And I warned Nate Diaz at the camp about that and how to do it. If there's a check. That's the best thing you could do. You could do uh, lift leg defense. Uh, and you could do a limp out of it if you have a proper uh, stance for MMA fighting with low kicks. Um, anyway, guys. Uh, and, and I had an article on ProMadeOutNow.com uh, a few years back as well. So everyone's embraced uh, calf kicks now, and commentators have since mid-2017. Uh, you'll see that theme a lot in all these fights. And then cage wrestling, 10-9 uh, to Drakkar, uh, close from Michigan. 
I believe round two, more forward pressure, devastating calf kicks, devastating, making uh, Lando switch to southpaw often, even though he's obviously not as comfortable in that stance. Winning him that round 10-9. So calf kicks, calf kicks, calf kicks. Or the SLK super low kick. Uh, round three, Jakar Close still pressuring ahead. Uh, but one minute left, Lando does get a good single leg. It takes the back, but he's kind of too high. It takes the back standing down turtle, but kind of too high. It's going to slide off the top. He thinks I, I would have regained it instead of bailing. But he just hopped off and bailed on it. Uh, and the close was like, no, nah, dude, I can wrestle too. He did a single leg uh, takedown, kind of tit for tat kind of thing. Um, close did a really good performance. Um, but like many the lab fighters uh, uh, of Krauss down in uh, outside Phoenix, Arizona, Glendale, Arizona, they have a great overall game, but a lot of his fighters, and maybe that's because he's trying to avoid them fighting in the pocket with boxing, getting brain damage, probably is, but they do lack, uh, and I'll probably put this on his Facebook page, I wonder what he'll think, um, John Crouch that is, um, but um, they kind of lack uh, boxing in the pocket. That's the one area that they can improve on is maybe getting a boxing coach for boxing in the pocket. Or if that is more the, like, let's avoid brain damage thing, like it is with Mike Winklejohn, he's saying, don't fight like me, fight at distance, control distance with calf kicks and oblique kicks and side kicks to the knee. Um, they could at least be doing some of my like systema like or bare knuckle boxing like punch rolling drills and like half speed stuff and that'll get guys better just because close to fought really good other than he kind of like shies away from punches sometimes and really isn't keeping his eyes open um anyway really good performance by him he he stepped up his game he's someone to watch 30 27 unanimous decision by jakar close and a really great performance then at baton Rafael Unsun Sao, uh, rank number three, versus Rob Front at rank number 11. I uh, in interviewed uh, Unsun Sao, I think at a uh, Jiu Jitsu Worlds or something, uh, before he was even in the UFC. Nice guy, he seemed like. Uh, round one, even striking affair, except for one big 3 2 left hook, right straight, quick knockdown by Unsun Sao, which gives him the round 10 9. He does tend to win rounds and closely. Now, round number two, uh, Unsun Sao right immediately waits for a punch. I think a jab came in, changes level, shoots a double underneath, easily gets that takedown. Kind of a tricky thing. You know, set up like, oh, we're going to strike, and then now all of a sudden, boom, he gets his takedown in the very beginning of the second round. Um, showing some experience there. It's like, hey, here's an easy round. I get on top right away. My Jiu Jitsu and wrestling control uh, keeps me there. Um, so he passes guard, good pressure, ground and pound from side control. Halfway through the round, front does escape back up to his feet. Uh, but pretty even striking affair the rest of the round, so obviously another 10-9 round for Unsun Sao. Uh, number three, halfway through the round, uh, another double leg by Rafael Unsun Sao, who eventually passes. They kind of in the guard and then pass, and then in the guard and then half, and then pass. 30-27, uh, unanimous decision for Unsun Sao, who then uh, called out, like, what do I got to do to get a title shot? I'm quite guy. Yeah, I'm not knocking fools out, but I'm winning against a bunch of top guys very consistently. Uh, in the entertainment era, I'm not sure if that's going to quite cut it. You know, I probably will eventually because he's been at the top for so long. But, you know, I get where he's coming from, and uh, it is what it is. Next up, at middleweight, Uriah Hall versus Polo Costa, or Costa. I think they say it Costa, but, uh, you know, the Greek in me wants to say Costa. So, uh, Costa, Costa, uh, marches forward like a Brazilian action figure that has eaten way too much acai in his life. Powerful acai it is. Just buy it at the store anywhere in Brazil. Uh, but it does, he does uh, kick... Um, Hall in the groin a couple times and gets a warning for eye poking. Uh, or at least having them kind of out and set up. Uh, Uriah Hall, even though they're not under the new rules yet. Uriah in, in Las Vegas. Uriah did land stinging up jabs, very good stinging up jabs, and a beautiful fadeaway hop back sidekick to the stomach. Round two, Coast, uh, um, during a five punch combo, he comes in and then Uriah throws a jab kind of overhand, the overhand clips him in the temple ear area, uh, really hurts him. 
But again, that acai, that acai is strong, brother. And uh, because of acai fueled veins, um, let's say, in my humble opinion, uh, being, you know, a big buff Brazilian guy, obviously he's got to love acai, right? Um, is, is strong and he pushes forward from a double forearm guard to bang into the body and a good uppercut was in there as well to the body and to the head. He makes the body shots uh, to the head really well and it's the body shots that were really um, were banging Hall up, like taking his heart away so when he got hit in the head, following it really hard, uh, basically made Hall crumble down to the ground, finished 12-0 and 0 with 12 finishes for this guy, this action figure, looking like a young Vitor Belfort, uh, but he does mix in body shots really, really well. So we'll see how far he can go, and that's probably all I should say about that. I think you got the point by now. Moving on to the main card, we got amazing kickboxer Gokan Saki taking on, I believe it's Khalil, Khalil Roundtree. At light heavyweight, Khalil's a big dude. Uh, I think he's a FFG, a former fat guy. I think he would say that. I think he was over 300 pounds and uh, lost weight. Um, Gokan Saki, 83 and 12 kickboxing record, former Glory and K1 champion. Fought once previously in the UFC uh, with a KO TKO finish. Wonderful left hook. And uh, Khalil softball though, and he actually wanted this fight. Saki throws some kicks, and then he keeps switching back and forth to southpaw. After he switched to southpaw, landed in a southpaw leg kick. Goes back to orthodox. Goes back to southpaw. I think he even did it two more times. He's like, well, maybe I should do this again. And Roundtree was waiting. He threw the leg kick. Roundtree with the longer reach. Straight left down the pipe. Boom, knocks him on his butt. Six hammer fists later and gets the amazing upset TKO finish. I doubt... Very few people were betting on Roundtree to win. Roundtree's never been a great grappler or a great wrestler. He did switch camps, go turn to Kenny Johnson, somewhere in California probably, Black House or, or somewhere around there, just privately got him. Um, but um, amazing by, by Roundtree. Saki looking a little soft and weak, you know, for these uh, UFC guys. Um, you know, maybe he's not on the Acai train like he used to be when he fought big heavyweights in K1. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I just know that if you look at my weight cutting vid, I talk a lot in there. Maybe I'll make a, uh, a future video on um, proper things we could do to actually cheaply and easily get rid of Usa you know, Usada and, and, and measure guys' total testosterone and make it an actual almost equal playing field across the board no matter what they do. Um, next up, Michael Chiesa taking on Anthony Pettis at 155, but Chiesa misses weight for the first time at 157.5. Uh, please, guys, check out that um, very doable, my how to get rid of extreme weight cutting video. I really in-depth thought about it. I know gave a lot of tidbits about guys' actual weigh-in fights, what's going on, how guys cheat, uh, you know, and everything else. Uh, it's got a lot of thumbs up. I think you will like it. Uh, check out my... MMA analyst, MMA technical analyst, how to end extreme weight cutting video. Anyway, Chiesa catches a right body kick and a double leg, landing on a top half guard. Pettis comes out the back door from kind of a bad back take, a rush back take by Chiesa because he had a seatbelt, and then he kind of rushed uh, to take the back, uh, and Pettis just slipped out, kind of, kind of, kind of doggy tripod up, slipped out the back. Uh, and then back to the feet, Chiesa pressures more, eventually gets outside leg trip, but Pettis quickly back up again. And then the last minute of the first round, Pettis takes control with low kicks. Uh, he catches a front kick uh, by Chiesa and kind of messes with that. And then at the very end of the round, Chiesa's kind of running away because the, the, the tide's totally changed. And Pettis comes forward with a punch in the foot, steps on his foot, just like the Robot Metro in Real Steel <coughs> that I was. Um, Steps on the foot and that trips him down. Um, kind of the punch, but really the, the stepping on the foot uh, chaos that happened that knocked him down, but probably stole him the round, in all honesty. Um, so that was the first round. Oh, he also barely missed a tornado kick, or I don't know if you want to call it a 360, 720, or 560, 540, whatever you want to call that kick. I call it a tornado kick. Um, barely missed it. Kids ducked it uh, right at the end of the round. 
So, uh, between rounds, Kiesa's could be heard telling to his corner he thought that Pettis may be greased. So, that's something, uh, you know, it doesn't mean it's true, but when fighters say that, you should pay attention to future fights if there's a, any future complaints of uh, something like this. You know, I'm just a sweaty, greasy uh, Greek guy, so maybe some people are that way, maybe some people aren't. Uh, but, you know, if you go back in the GSP's career, everyone forgot about Greasegate, but even before before Greasegate, um, Mayhem Miller accused him of greasing before that. So, you know, seeing the trend here, you should pay attention to things, guys. Um, anyway, round number two, uh, Pettis lands a hard right body kick and a crisp right, right? Dropping Chiesa, basically, there was kind of a jump knee in there that didn't land and pulls an arm and guillotine. He rushed it, but maybe he didn't, because uh, Kiesa pops his head out. He jumps to the triangle. The triangle looks tight. Then he deep underhooks the leg, basically does a toss, uh, off balances Kiesa. Kiesa goes to his back and gets the triangle armbar for the extension submission win. Hey, Pettis was talking about this before the fight. He said, I'm going to stop working on my wrestling, being so paranoid about takedowns. That's what's led to my losing streak, as opposed to fighting the way I used to do, open, basically in the WEC, and, and at first in the UFC being a striker, and if you take me down, I'm going to sub you, kind of like Cowboy Cerrone used to do. I mean, you know, those were the two guys that were really at this. Like, I'm going to kick you in the head, and if you manage to take me down from the pressure, when I'm kicking the head, giving that forward pressure, and I fall on my back, boom, I'll hit that triangle or that armbar, pretty quickly and that is what he did so in a way you could still see his wrestling uh you know maybe he's not concerned about the takedowns as much but those instincts now he really worked on his wrestling got his head under the chin and stuff that's always going to pay off for him do i think you can get to um, a championship level again with that kind of theory no i don't think so i think you always need wrestling you always need to be i'm always striking where i'm always on top i'm not accepting body to be a champion in modern MMA, you know, does he have a good guard? Has he submitted really good guys like Melendez who had never been submitted before? Absolutely. We'll see how far he can go back up um, if he kind of continues that in the future. Can you be number two, three? Yeah, absolutely. Can you be champion number one? Until guys develop a leg hook guard like I've been preaching for years, how to leg hook guard and, and elbow from bottom to set up the umaplata and stuff like that and have your umaplata on the side instead of your back so it's actually a high percentage and not just a sweep, a high percentage submission. Until guys really kind of figure that stuff out, you don't want to be on your back in MMA. For the most part, the beautiful submission and just a guy who's going for the kill all the time is always exciting. Okay, let me get a sip of water, guys. I hope you're enjoying this. Um, you know, I could be more detailed and technical and go round by round, but, you know, the videos be pretty long, then, and i got two other events I need to cover after this video. Paul Felder moves up to welterweight to face Mike Perry. Uh, Felder was going to fight a week later, I think at 55, not sure on that. Um, so he gets called up to fight Perry, or kind of asked for it when Perry's opponent uh, falls out. Felder opens up with a hard calf kick, seeing something going on here. Uh, and they clash heads, head what happened. I think both guys actually get cut. They're clinched against Cage. Perry lands a beautiful right elbow, kind of off the brakes always whenever there's that pressure. He's got that deep left underhook. He's coming with a big elbow. Over the top, and he does an oblique kick to the knee. Right away, Rogan does correctly call it out. Like, look, you go to Wink John for two months, and boom, suddenly you're doing oblique kicks to the knee, which isn't a bad thing. I've been preaching oblique kicks or... Uh, Savat Chasse Boss G Direct since 2011, March 2011. I had one of the very first videos on all of YouTube, if not the first, on using that for MMA. Uh, anyway, guys, uh, do, 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 Perry lands uppercut elbow. Hit, they both try uppercut and spear elbows. Perry's uppercut elbow landed better this round. Felder lands spinning elbow better this round. There's a lot of elbow action and spinning elbow action going on. Uh, filled it at the end of the round while moving backwards, getting pushed to the cage. Does land a spinning back fist. It might have been what hurt his arm, actually. We'll get to that later. Um, at the end of round two, and because he was moving back, maybe he misjudged the distance. I don't know if they ever isolated when he hurt his arm, but that might have been it at the, end, at the very end of the first round. Round two, Perry gets a high crouch takedown. Kind of a lot of muscle that lifts him up really high in the air to then uh, try and dump him down. Uh, briefly on the ground. Back up, lands a good elbow. Uh... Then Perry kind of takes two minutes off. And it seems like Felder didn't really notice it. 
kind of Perry relax that's that's kind of new to him so you see what wink did for a while which was effective with like arlovsky um and uh, over him especially and they kind of chilled out and they like more measured and better distance control uh that seemed to be working for perry uh, so he took a, a couple almost a couple minutes off and then boom then he ram leaping the left hook mike tyson kind of hit at this angle busted up folder's eye bloody even worse um, and that's the kind of thing Perry maybe needs to do is to go to distance control and relax so he can be that kind of violent banger. Like, th th this was a much better Mike Perry, much less off balance, kept his head behind his front knee, his front knee not extending over his front foot. Like, he actually looked like a professional in there instead of what everyone else is all hyped about. And, like, people like me are looking at, like, dude, you kind of suck. Um, you know, his heart and banging was there, but... That's not what I want to see. I want to see what I saw today and how far that can go. Um, and Phil is very technical. This was a good fight. So uh, after that leaping left hook, Perry lands uh, an elbow, and he kind of does a slide by to a go behind, sort of. Gets the back of Felder and does a really crappy uh, souple attempt. Really crappy. Kind of lands on his own head, but he does turn in and manages to get on top a bit off of that. Um, definitely needs to work on his wrestling. He was trying, using it to fight, but he definitely needs to like technically clean uh, wrestling up, just like he needs to technically clean up all everything in his game. Uh, round three, Perry does Terminator forward, uh, and Felder does time some great uh, good knees to the body and a backside kick to the body, while all this while having a broken arm. So he's had a broken arm for at least a, a round of most, if not two rounds since the end of the first round. Uh, possibly from the spinning back fist. So, you know, Felder's a warrior and moving up in a way. I think he's technical enough and almost big enough, but now he was taking heavier shots for the first time. And Perry's a heavy, heavy hitter, but not the biggest uh, welterweight. Um, they both finished around banging away really good. Good finish. That's what everyone wants to see. Uh, Perry looked much better, much more technical, calculated since moving to Jackson Wink. I give a lot of that to Wink. Wink's a Wink was a banger in Muay Thai. He wasn't the most technical guy. He was a typical Muay Thai, like banging out kind of guy until one of us falls. Um, but I think he learned from that, and he taught the guy's distance control. Again, you saw that totally in Arlovsky. Um, uh, or over him, and, and in Ar Arlovsky as well. But, uh, you know, going to John Jones and, and everybody. So, um, cleaned him up. Cleaned him up really well in two months. Maybe, maybe Perry does have what it takes, because he did, I don't know. I was never that impressed with the guy. Uh, Perry giving you props, dude. You, you made the move, and uh, he cleaned things up to a professional level. So, uh, anyway, that's good to see. 29-28, split decision, Mike Perry. And now, on to the co-main event, lack of action. Francis Nagano versus Derek Lewis. Now, Nagano is a guy, the first ever ever in MMA to use the combatives head twist to get off the cage that I teach. It was missed by everybody. It was in the first round versus Stipe. It's the only time he got himself off the cage. Um, taught that at a seminar years ago, guys, on YouTube, our seminar. It's, it's got tons of thumbs up. Anyone that does watch it likes it because I really technically explain a lot about biomechanics, structure, breaking structure, takedowns, uh, chin twists, all kinds of stuff. Um, but mostly was to applying it, how do we use this knowledge, this kind of Russian martial arts knowledge and just uh, biophysics knowledge to um, use an MMA anti-cage. Anyway, saying that I like Nagano because he maybe saw my video because I made a short video years ago when why MMA fighters, UFC fighters use my anti-cage techniques for tactics. And, uh, and he did it and it worked out well for him that one time at least versus Steven. But having said that, I honestly... And I'm, I, my notes here are writing before I watch the fight. So this isn't me uh, saying in hindsight, I thought that Derek Lewis would actually win this fight. Um, if I had somewhere to bet that didn't have to get my credit card overseas, uh, you know, I would I would uh, definitely bet on the co-main and main event. Um, I've been following Derek Lewis since the uh, Axis TV days. Like, no, oh, so this guy goes, hey, punch me in the face for a round, tell yourself.